We are going to now so talk about a subject uh, that uh, involves what we could call risk governance. Uh, science involves scientists, uh, government as, as, uh, agencies, uh, um, regulators, uh, public citizens, etc. So we have this roundtable. Um, we have Anne Perra and Elizabeth Weiderpass, uh, and I'd like to thank you for being with us. We also have Sophie, Sophie Pelletier, who also spoke to us during the day. She's a chair of Priartem, which is a French association created in the 2000s uh, and which examines this health-related impact of uh, electromagnetic uh, fields, in particular for the uh, uh, hyper-sensitive uh, individuals. We've talked about this already. We also have Pierre Delven from the University of, Bel of Liège in Belgium. He is a researcher in social sciences and particularly in subjects related to the link between science and society. But he's really a social scientist. Uh, He's not someone who is used to working uh, on radio frequencies, uh, but I think it's interesting to have someone from the outside and who can listen to this discussion and uh, who can give us uh, the, that outside view. So as not to uh, repeat the other sessions with the four ten-minute uh, um, pr um, presentations, I would suggest that we have just a series of short questions and then we'll have exchange among ourselves and w with the room, with the audience. So, first of all, we've tried to look at all the different types of research projects that are, have been taken out, uh, taken And uh, the different risks that they that are presented by uh, various types of exposure, and the time aspect is uh, is always very important. To, in in a sh relatively short time, we've gone from two G to five G technologies, and it's interesting to take. Uh, a little bit of a step back and look at the different actors in the system. GMS was something that we, which, which duplicated what we did in the, the beginning from home with just talking on the phone and then we added just short SMS messages. That was with a 2J, then with 3J we had greater bandwidth and so we started exchanging photos and using internet uh, and with the 4G in 2010 uh, we started using the smartphone completely differently in other words not as a telephone and incredibly there are changes among uh, generations the young gen younger generations use their phones differently from older generations. So the object is, escapes those who uh, designed it originally. And the deployment is extremely fast. And this is the deployment of these modifications. And now we're moving on to 5G, which is going to go even faster. And it's there will be short reaction times. We'll have uh, the Internet, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, in lots of different fields, but the common point in all this is that this is a, a an intersection between developments that are um, approved of or not by the users. For example, some time ago there was a, a, a sort of a, a, a war or a competition between Blackberries and, and iPhones and, and today the Blackberry has disappeared and so there there are exchanges forms of exchange that correspond to different needs in society. 
And scientific activities are related to the time necessary for research. For example, toxicological research requires specific protocols which are not always easy to understand. And so we have to understand what's necessary for animals, what corresponds to animal exposure and what can be translated to human exposure. And we're talking about tremendous developments and we're, there's, a, there's this, this race for power and the speaker is speaking extremely quickly and the interpreter does not have the text just to point that out. So research continues to move forward and what's attracting those research projects? Is it because of uh, funding? You've seen through certain pub pu publications that there are, is probability to find research results that are insignificant. So, and this is not exactly attractive to researchers. And there are other factors that can be, uh, that are not very encouraging. This is a controversial subject uh, as well. So between the world of technological development, which is moving faster, very fast, and the world of research, which takes more time, there is this temporal gap. We have uh, lots of different players, NGOs, associations, government workers, researchers, and so this roundtable is bringing together a certain number of those uh, stakeholders to talk about their expectations and talk to, about this with you and to look at the relation between science and society. So I promised some, that we would do something very dynamic and so we're going to move on to the questions and I'm going to first ask the first question to Anne Pereira. As a high-level researcher at the University of Strasbourg, you know that what are the reasons for that you and your team study the link between radio frequencies and uh, the living world? Well, for reasons. that There's a scientific curiosity that started when I started doing uh, working for ANSES 10 years ago. And I discovered a lot of uh, literature it was very enriching it was very diverse which and it and it linked to human human brains animals cognition etc and i saw an opportunity in regards in relation to what i'd been doing for a long time which was working on long term memory and if we you know we have different types of memory and I work on rodent models, and I hadn't seen anything on long-term memory in radio frequency um, studies, and so I decided to go a little bit further because the results were very heterogeneous, and so we really don't know the link between radio frequencies between living organisms and others, and so I decided to go and look, take a closer look and make a proposal of a certain approach. So that was my first reason. Dr. Vayer Bass, as an international scientific, part of an international scientific organization, radio frequencies are just a, a subject among others when it comes to risk factors that related to um, cancer. There are other factors, of course. So how, what kind of role does that uh, does the subject to play? Well, radio frequencies are a, 
an important subject. We have a work group working on that subject. Uh, this is part of our five-month, uh, five-year plan, and we hope to continue that work after, even after a five-year plan. We have to point out that because for radio low level radio frequencies we haven't confirmed the mechanisms that could be damaging to humans. We don't know what the technical parameters are that we should be studying and what is the relationship with human biology and potentially with the development of certain pathologies. So, so we have to continue studying those phenomena and particularly long-term phenomena because technologies are evolving and we still don't know what the effect of technology are, is are on different age groups. And there is a community in France studying this subject and we continue to work on it as well. Sophie Pintier, as I said in the beginning, generations, gen technological generations are following uh, one after another very quickly, and their use is, goes uh, much beyond what we would have expected uh, for even five or six years ago. Um, we wouldn't have expected so many f smartphones uh, starting when children are 12, 13 years old, or even earlier, children start demanding their smartphones. And yet there is no obvious massive wave of public health issues. So, so what does an association like yours look at, especially because we're talking about differences in different parts of the world? Sometimes you may have a the possibility of getting feedback from other regions. What, how, where do you stand on that? The observations that we can make for public health are very different. There, there we do have data from Santé Publique France and, and the public, French Social Security program that shows that certain types of pathologies like aggressive uh, brain cancers are that the incidence is changing in the general public. So we don't have no data on that. And there are also a lot of questions that are not being addressed uh, in relation to these questions. Three qu quick examples. First of all, concerning electro -hypersen hypersensibility, it was said earlier that there were no figures, no statistics in France. Uh, you had to come up with a median 5% of the population based on international figures. So we lack data on that subject. And then there are subjects like, for example, pancreatic cancer. A few years ago, they said that there was a, a strong signal on pancreatic cancer, but we don't know why. And today, I am not aware of any studies be done between the li on a link between radio frequency and uh, pancreatic cancer. I'm not saying there is a link, but there there is can be a, a met metabolical link. And why not examine that question? We have no data on that either, and I think that's a very serious uh, um, gap. And third, the impact on of, of animals and plants, uh, on the wild animals and plants. There are no an, no, there's no data on that either. So we lack data. There's a lot of uh, data that is missing, even though it sub concerns subjects that are very problematic. I could go into more detail if we have time. Anyway, thank you very much for those uh, concrete examples, which do show, indeed, how scientific work is asking, bringing up questions, and but doesn't always bring the answers. There are always more questions. And I think this is something that's new. We, we, meant, we heard a little bit about uh, blue light and, and the environment, and this opens up another aspect of this question. 
And the question behind all of that, which we don't talk much about, is what should we do first? So what uh, should we deal with as a priority topic? Uh, we have other uh, health issues. I mean, uh, we've uh, had them uh, since uh, risk uh, activities exist, risky activities uh, such as uh, using steam engines or others. But we have here yeah, biotechnologies, uh, and we have a situation here that's uh, uh, very much uh, the situation of radio frequencies and technology is moving forward so quickly that uh, we can't even have time to uh, look at things. I mean, did we really manage to assess the risks? Uh, thank you for your invitation. It is a pleasure to be with you uh, today. Uh, we um, spoke of speeding up uh, technologies and this is a, a question that comes uh, together with any new technologies, not uh, specific to radio frequencies. Uh, but the development of uh, technologies has to be anchored in society, uh, market, and we have uh, uh, temporalities that uh, um, uh, that. that um, um, are confronted. Each choice in terms of technology leads society uh, towards uh, uh, a specific path, and it's always uh, more easy to move forward than uh, move back. Uh, yes, I worked on biotechnologies in the medical and agricultural uh, sector. I worked uh, on uh, GMOs, uh, especially um, soya. Uh, soya beans in uh, Argentina, Brazil, and the United States. The United States uh, was the uh, first uh, country regulating the development of GMOs. Argentina was second. And uh, from Argentina, some uh, interesting uh, phenomenon developed that is the legal trading in uh, seeds, uh, and the government uh, was in front of a situation, and uh, they had to uh, acknowledge that uh, they had to regulate GMOs because all the uh, other uh, southern countries uh, were filled with. Uh, um, modified uh, crops. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, you have different uh, time scales. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, social networks, they are 20 years old, and we've seen how they destabilized uh, political communication, uh, elections, uh, even uh, political regimes. So this question comes up uh, regularly, and when I'm speaking of different timescapes. Uh, we're speaking here of uh, uh, research with uh, protocols that were uh, presented to us. We uh, respected a whole series of uh, criteria uh, for uh, results that are of signification, but this time scale is not the same as uh, uh, the one in the political world, the media. Uh, it's not the same as uh, uh, the time scale for regulations, we often uh, tend, and I'll conclude on this, to uh, assume that technologies are developing and that uh, regulations or uh, policy makers are always uh, lagging behind. It's true, but we can always uh, look at things differently. Technologies are emerging uh, not out of nowhere. There is something there. Uh, and for instance, you cannot clone human uh, beings. Uh, there are a series of experiences that are uh, banned. So regulation is here. Well, I don't know if uh, uh, we are all smugglers uh, in uh, 
new technologies. Uh, would you like to add something to the interventions of uh, your colleagues before we move on to a second series of interventions? Yes, if I may. Thank you for your comments on all that we don't know about uh, uh, cancer. When you are speaking of the cancer of the pancreas, there are many uh, things that we don't know. We don't know uh, why they uh, appear in people who have no risk factor. But we also know that diabetes and obesity increase the risks. And what we see in the French population is that obesity and diabetes is increasing strongly. And this uh, increases a, a great part of uh, cancer of the pancreas. I'm not saying that this uh, prevents us from looking more in depth as uh, at sorry the epidemiology of uh, cancer of the pancreas, but half of uh, these people, that is half of uh, the people who have that, it's due to uh, smoking. French people smoke too much. That's why they get half of the cancers they have, and then they drink. This explains 5 to 8 percent of all cancers throughout the French territory. There's obesity and junk food. This explains another 8 percent of all cancers. Uh, so we know this, and we shouldn't forget all that we already know and that can be avoided. Well, if uh, you allow me to answer, this is uh, uh, very much relevant. That's what I meant. I wasn't trying to say that uh, uh, radiations were uh, responsible for all cancers, and especially not cancer of the pancreas, but all that is to do with metabolism. Uh, I mean, did that trigger uh, questions uh, on exposure? I don't have this impression when uh, I take the study of Lerkel of 2015 that shows uh, uh, the carcinogenous effect of uh, um, radio frequencies. And we are below uh, the uh, limit values. When I see the studies on uh, rats, the relation to uh, thermal regulation, well, one can ask the question of not acute toxicity such as it's been done until now uh, with uh, heavy users, or, but the impact of chronic exposure with low exposure to low doses and we have literature about this currently that shows that we have nonlinear impact in terms of dose response well one can ask the question of these low levels of exposure and whether they have the uh, properties uh, that we've seen, for instance, uh, with endocrine disruptors. I have the impression that it is an emerging field that uh, uh, some teams uh, touch upon them, uh, but uh, that is not core to research. And when we see uh, the uh, developments of chronic diseases that are linked, of course, to other environmental issues. But when we look at young generations and when we see the percentage of young people who are obese, who have diabetes, we cannot uh, say that all oh, this is due to tobacco, or to smoking, to alcohol. There are other factors that need to be uh, researched, uh, such as uh, radio uh, frequency, and I think it's not often investigated, not enough anyway. One quick reaction. There are many things that we know, uh, and uh, one of the speakers said about not knowing. And not knowing is not about ignoring. We have uh, researches here that show that uh, uh, with the state of knowledge 
it's maybe difficult to establish a causal uh, link, but not knowing uh, is about knowing what we don't know rather than not knowing what we don't know. I think it is a difference that is important. Sometimes it is difficult to establish a causal link two quick reactions and then we move on to the next round of questions uh, this uh, uh, environmental health research uh, occupational health it, it remains open and uh, we also have experts that are calling for contributions in terms of endocrine disruptors so, so if there are experts in the room uh, you have the opportunity here to take part now as for the use by uh, youth of smartphones uh, well there's the issue of uh, physical activity uh, and uh, there's also uh, deprivation of sleep that is a huge risk factor for the whole population and notably the young people unité d'experts spécialisés de l'ANSES qui est un petit peu le cœur de la fabrique de l'expertise vous avez donc eu we you have uh, concluded you've worked on the this uh, 5g report and yet you have uh, concluded with a caution that what were the you made conclusions although they were cautious what how do you feel about your work for ANSES and as researcher and what do you think of about the next steps With this report on the 5G that was commissioned by various ministries, including the Minister of Health, uh, in a very short time, this has been a very complex uh, ex expertise to get together. We're asking ANSES uh, and experts, uh, its experts, uh, to look at and to validate, uh, to, to read all of the literature. And with the 5G, we have this has been very complicated because we knew that we had to go out and look for information. We've started looking at the 5G two years ago, so maybe there's a little bit more information out there now. But in terms of uh, scientific literature reg in regards to humans or animals, there was practically nothing. It was a new technology. So, indeed, there is a, a, the question of time. There's the the time scale of research, and the, and then there's the for research, and then there's a time scale for technology, and uh, the team, the researchers have to have to define a pro project, then they have to find the sun funding, then they have to f they have uh, three years, four years when they're lucky, and then then they have to draft the publication, and so they, we come up with a. a time scale of about 10 years which is absurd when it come when you compare it with the um, technological progress time scale so we did the best we could probably not satisfactory but I think we were able to come up with some recommendations cautious recommend and a cautious conclusion and of course we have to continue on this but as uh, Sophie Pelletier said the we lack so much information, just so much information. It's it's actually terrifying. Dr. Vibopasta, we've talked a little about uh, monographs and we talked about the, the protocols for um, weighing evidence. Can you feel a need to make changes in the in the time scale. Yes, as my colleague just said, yes, of course, we're going too slowly for several reasons. For re radio frequencies, but also for other scientific demands. And is uh, your question is uh, is a uh, ARC too slow for to this sort of study? Well, yes, maybe so. Why? Well, because uh, we assess existing literature, and so if there's a 
a, a, a lag due to publication of research, then we have to wait. We're, we're waiting for research pro papers to come out. And next, a very ordinary kind of problem, we have only five people. If we had ten, a team of ten, we would much more, we'd go more quickly. And why do we have a, only a team of ten? Well, because we lack money. So the quest, it's a question of how much we invest in research. And we need permanent, uh, qualified, high qualified permanent uh, personnel. So it's a question of, of uh, resources for research. I was uh, interested to see whether I would find a, a source of inspiration in your answer. Sophie Pentier, the research timescale being what it is and rigor rigorous methodology is uh, uh, important. Can you, have you identified levers in, in different fields, expertise, research, regulations, and where changes could come in and the stakeholders would have a role to play. Well, I'm glad you confirmed that we are, uh, that the rigor, rigorousness of our expertise is extremely important. You're right about that. We call for, and I think that ANSYS does too, we want an assessment of technology before that it's deployed and not afterwards. And we want, we need the means to do so. There's a sort of asymmetry between the tremendous resources that are used to deploy technology like 5G and the resources that are deployed for to do research on that same technology. So this is a question of public policy. So we have a responsibility to, to make ourselves heard on that, uh, on that issue. But we know that we're up against a bunch of uh, mastodons. There's also a question of uh, redesigning standards. This the the government lets industry uh, make uh, maybe too many individual decisions, uh, and the pr providers say, "Well, we're." We're within the uh, standard, so we don't. So, this is perfectly safe, and we all know perfectly well that these standards are designed by partnerships, and uh, they're very quickly obsolete. So. And it's up to ANSES to look at these thing, these issues. Another point concerns the connection with the. The uh, health watch. I think that there's a gap there as well compared to epidemiology, for which, okay, epidemiology tries to be very conclusive and rigorous, uh, and, uh, and they uh, are looking for proof. Uh, but for us, Epidemiology is a, the science of observation. It's meant to uh, to describe the situations, and I think that uh, we should be we should come back to to that base in order to generate data that doesn't exist, which is data which is not necessarily proof, but it can open up uh, the fields of research. We talked about the we talked about clusters and aggregates which need to be documented in regards to characterization of different exposures because when you have a cluster of of pediatric issues the the, the question of electromagnetic fields 
is is set aside because uh, supposedly we don't have data. Well, so if that's the case, then we'll never make progress on the subject. Another question concerns epidemiological studies that do not have much include much evidence, but maybe could be represent a lot of observation and could open up of different fields of ups, of research on different pathologies. For example, there's information on radio frequencies and the and the Charcot disease. The level of proof is evidence is very weak, but there is a signal. This is a very serious disease, a neuro neurodegenerative disease, and we need to look at that. Cohorts, longitudinal cohorts are very expensive and very long term. And and when 20 years down the line we realize that something has been dangerous, it's too late. So this, according, with the system that we have, we need to come up with different types of tools in order to react more quickly and to put out alerts more quickly and be much more conservative when it comes to regulations. Yes, indeed, there are tools for signals and alerts that are ad well adapted. Uh, for example, in pharmaco pharmacovigilance and uh, food vigilance. And th so these are rigorous methods uh, for defining situations. Uh, but these tools uh, are very often not used for human health. Uh, and it's difficult to transpose those tools to chronic situations, but I think it would be worthwhile to do so because when we apply these things, uh, we realize that uh, if we want to make progress on these issues, then we need to go out and find more data. data. Pierre de Leven, uh, one last question. Have what kinds of recommendations would you come up with, uh, having observed this, uh, the uh, interactions that we've had, and and the the roundtable and, and the presentations? Uh, is there something that our dialogue habits are keeping us from doing? Well, I would not allow myself to make recommendations, but there are a couple of observations that I could make, uh, and particularly in regards to this roundtable. First of all, regarding the assessment of technology, I think it's an illusion to say that we will be able to evolve technology upstream and then decide whether we give a go or no go. Partly because technology, as it's developed in laboratories, is very different when it's it, once it's been deployed and it's it shows the effects that it can have and when it's been uh, taken on by lots of uh, users there there are positive and negative effects there are foreseen and non foreseen uses so we need use spaces and mechanisms that will help us evolve te um, assess technology because check each technology has a different trajectory and is a a specific um, can, um, context. Uh, there's a con there's something in te te sociology that we call Colin Bridge te te dilemma. When something is being developed and it's in the laboratory, it's maybe easier to adapt it and and form it. But we don't know exactly how, what those what the effects are going to be when the th the object comes out of a, a laboratory. And according to this dilemma when we have you no know, the problem is that we have no we don't know what the technology is going to give so there are different spaces and we have to come up with new ways of understanding the situation so spaces like the one that you open today is very precious there are also spaces within political institutions which need to be reinforced or, or multiplied. For example, in France, the, at the Parliament, there's a 
the Parliamentary Office on Research and Scientific and Technological Research, and, and I think we need to we need multiple research spaces. That's one point. Se second point I'd like to make it concerns. Well, here we're talking about an issue which involves a whole series of phenomena that involves weak signs and we're talking about thresholds, exposure thresholds that can be variable and that are at the, 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 at the, the edge of uh, the measurable. There were some effects that were presented where we talked about active, uh, intensive users, uh, heavy users of mobile phones, and then light users of mobile phones. But there's a whole galaxy of uses and intensities of uses, and we need to look at all of that. Uh, but of course, we can't do research on everything. We have to isolate variables. Uh, but when it comes to public health, uh, it's sometimes difficult to establish links between exposure to radio frequencies and cancers or other types of diseases. But despite that, it does not mean that technology does not produce an effect. Look at the example of a smartphone. You can see how smartphones have disrupted everything. For example, the, uh, attention spans, difficulties, uh, differences in view, uh, in uh, vision, excuse me, when, when you're looking at a smartphone all day, it changes uh, the, uh, your visual capacities. Uh, and so we need approaches that are ecological and involve the relations between one aspect and another and that could create links between radio frequencies and, and endocrinian disease or, or, or rare disease. That's the second point. The third point that I wanted to bring up goes back to what Yves Le Drian said earlier. A researcher, a researcher doesn't doesn't try to force, doesn't try to prove what he thinks, but tries to explain what he sees. We talked about conflict of interest, and we talked about bias and and subjectivity, which comes into play. And yes, of course, subjectivity is. Uh, always present, uh, but the th that doesn't mean that the results are going to be biased. It doesn't mean, it just means that uh, uh, when a researcher does an experiment, uh, he always has a, a, a goal. He's always looking for uh, a result. And so depending on that that uh, results, uh, then the, the researcher readjusts uh, the parameters of the variables, but the, there's, it goes beyond that. The problem that we're talking about today is not a question just of laboratories. It's a question of a society becoming a laboratory. And in within that laboratory, we can't control the variables. And so because we can't control the variables, we have to look at other uh, systems, experimental systems. And we also need to go beyond the, the, the disciplinary horizons that are very often very narrow. And I'm not talking just for you. I'm talking for you, us as well. I think that we need to de develop a new language which will enable us to do interdisciplinary research and, and share our, our results so that we can interact together among between soft science and hard science. And I think that that's, it's really important that we be able to do that in order to study these different types of experimentations that, uh, uh, that are linked to, to, to technology in our daily life. Thank you very much for this uh, testimony. Uh, I would like to uh, mention that uh, uh, we have uh, representatives here that heard a certain number of messages. So it's also here uh, the opportunity to give the floor to the audience, but also to all other speakers. And then we'll have to leave uh, uh, at a reasonable time. Yes, lady. Maybe we don't have enough mics, so let's share them. What I suggest we do is take three, four questions, and then uh, we'll try uh, and answer them. Uh, let's do a bit of pooling, if I may use this expression. I'd like to get back to the discussion on timescale regulations. Um, I had this in mind when I uh, 
I came here today. I wanted to know when the IARC or the WHO, following the assessments of uh, uh, WHO, um, was going to reassess the classification of um, RF uh, radiations. So, what is going to be the time uh, scale? Uh, is it uh, for the next five years, for the next ten years? And if you do this reassessment, do you have ideas or an opinion uh, about the potential that uh, it be reclassified from 2B to 2A? Oh, sorry, I have to wait for a couple of questions. Okay. Um, it's Elizabeth Vidopas, I think, who's going to answer this question. Next question. Well, let me introduce myself once again. Uh, AZB, this means white spot. I like to speak for a moment about this interest. When you work for an association that defends uh, Electro hypersensitive people and their need to have white spots so that uh, they can take a bit of fresh air because some of them have huge difficulties uh, in their daily life. I'm speaking of the extreme situation that is stayed. Uh, stage three people who can now even come to this room, people who uh, live in a cave or 1,000 uh, meters in altitude. Um, you have the impression that you are against uh, 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 the government, against researchers. Uh, uh, this is uh, unbearable. Uh, I mean, which player is going to join us? When uh, you uh, carry out research, when you're trying to uh, determine the impact of uh, uh, radiations on two people, how uh, do you have uh, uh, control group. How do you get that when uh, you don't agree on uh, having white spot? When you agree on not having any white spot throughout the territory? Yes, gentlemen. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my uh, question. I uh, fully subscribe to uh, the p point of view of the gentleman before me. Uh, all the presentations that were made mentioned two parameters, uh, the intensity and the frequency. These are two obvious parameters, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the shape of the wave has never been mentioned, sine wave or pulsed wave. A sine wave doesn't have the same impact as a pulsed a digital wave of the same uh, power. <clears throat> and uh, if uh, this is uh, uh, an aspect that's uh, relevant to you, I'd like it to be taken into account in, the fu in future research. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, mine is really a comment uh, to what, uh, Sophie, you said, because, uh, and I'm serious here, I, I think that was the best advocacy I heard for a long time for the COSMOS study, because uh, you were requesting that we need an instrument that allows us flexibility to address new questions when they emerge. And yes, we mentioned today that, that COSMOS, of course, the first Hypothesis will we be addressing will be again the question of mobile phones and brain tumors, but we are collecting all the outcomes for the participants in this study. So that includes all the types of cancer. This includes neurodegenerative disease. This, this includes even questionnaires we have on, on outcomes where people are not dying from or are diagnosed in hospitals. So, so, so we have specific questionnaires for headache, for, for, for tinnitus, for sleep disturbances. So I think uh, this is really the instrument you were requesting is why we were trying to launch this study. And maybe we shouldn't call it study, but it's rather a surveillance instrument that, that, that we really uh, need. So, so I think there's something in place, but you're very welcome to, to look with us on, on the design. If you see some gaps that, that we can really fill by, by extending the design, I, I think that would be very important. And also your comment, I, I think when we discuss with ANSYS, uh, should we do Cosmos in France when already five other countries are doing it? Uh, exactly this question came up. Sometimes you don't want to just take the 
results from the Dutch because because there's this I mean you're not Dutch you're French mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes you want your data and this is both the exposure, but also many of the outcomes, because we see already in the first headache analysis, uh, it, it, the baseline is different across the countries. Uh, there, there's different mechanisms. You want the country-specific data. So also here, there I think you gave us a good justification of why we came later than the other countries, but added to this study, because for some of the questions, you want your national data, and you don't want to rely on only data that comes from outside the country. So, so really appreciating your comments. Merci pour ce commentaire, Joachim. Une dernière question et puis ensuite on passe. Thank you very much, Joachim, for this uh, comment and we'll move on uh, to the answers. I couldn't see in which order. Uh, well, if it's a lady, I'm handing over the mic. No, next uh, speaker is not a lady. I just wanted uh, to uh, comment two simple things. I come from Logistics, University of Assas Pantheon. Uh, people are very much right wing there. Uh, we ordered, uh, uh, we commissioned, commissioned some longitudinal uh, s research. Uh, maybe we can't have that for the future, but for the past. But, uh, gentlemen, we need to, you said we need to look at something uh, else than what's ahead of us. And I'd like to add what we do in logistics here. It's not a chain. It's not uh, an approach with a single approach. It is a multidimensional uh, environment. And so it's not only radiations that are at stake. There's also us. I'm a grandfather. I have grandchildren. You're going to have some. So there are many things that matter. And if uh, we uh, let uh, things happen, my children hide underneath their duvet uh, to uh, add another three, four hours. So I think it is important for the research that you carry out uh, uh, to take into account all aspects, uh, all society-related aspects. I'm getting, uh, I'm just at, um, back from my rheumatologist, and she said, you have a problem with your cervicals. How many hours uh, do you spend on your phone? Well, I'm sorry if uh, this is frustrating to some of you. We have uh, uh, to... Um, Uh, move on. You had uh, some comments. Uh, I thank you for this. Uh, now, as for the questions, there is some expertise uh, that we launched within the Institute on the impact of other information technologies, and especially for uh, children, and excluding radio frequencies and health, uh, looking at blue light and other issues. Uh, this is a, a tricky topic, but uh, we're trying. I'm turning to Olivier Merkel and Olivier, uh, who are steering this uh, work. Um, we are trying to make progress in this uh, uh, field as well, and the idea is uh, to see uh, whether uh, we can work uh, towards making recommendations. Uh, we have uh, uh, regulations, uh, but not only. Now, as for the white spots, I think it is a topic that uh, uh, is uh, uh, very much relevant to some associations. What we're trying to do uh, within the ANSYS is to have exploring investigation programs, uh, uh, trying to understand better through one or two uh, countries uh, the diversity of uh, uh, electrosensitivity. We, as uh, you were saying, uh, there are many uh, situations, uh, so uh, it's important to take into account this diversity to study them better and uh, build some ground that um, exit possible for us to make headway. Uh, 
but uh, the uh, small community of researchers that we represent might not weigh in uh, weigh on decision making now as for temporality um well, um, Elizabeth, uh, I guess you want to answer. The question was about monographies. Uh, this is a series of a series of uh, work to answer uh, the uh, question uh, of whether a substance or a phenomenon is carcinogenic for human beings or animals, and the classification. Uh, is as to uh, whether there is enough work published to uh, modify classification for radio frequencies. We have a group of experts who give us advice as to when substances have to be reassessed. Re, uh, radio um, frequencies have to be reassessed, and it is suggested that it should be in the years to come. I, it shouldn't take place at the beginning of 2023. I think uh, it's more likely that it will take place at the beginning of 2024. There are two important researches in Asia that are going uh, to be published in the two to four months to come. It's very important for these uh, uh, researches to be published before we can assess literature. Why do we do this? Because if we make an assessment and uh, and some work of significance is published a couple of weeks later, we might be criticized as to why we uh, did this uh, so early and did not wait uh, another couple of weeks to make the assessment. So this is going to take place, but we don't know whether evidence is going to be uh, higher or uh, lower. Uh, it might show that it is carcinogenic or not. And these are not IARC experts who are carrying out this work. These are experts who are invited to make up a working group to carry out this uh, group. I cannot to tell you where the, uh, the um, probabilities are going to be lower or higher. This is a group of experts that's uh, doing the job so that we publi publish uh, when assessment is made. One last question about the shape of uh, uh, the waves. I'm not sure that people from the panel can answer unless one of you want to. But well, I uh, don't mind saying a couple of words. This is one topic that uh, uh, is uh, very much relevant to ANSES. Uh, I'd like to uh, get uh, uh, back to uh, these uh, topics of uh, um, Nuri's uh, resounding uh, phenomenon. Uh, we spoke uh, this morning of uh, 902 and 950, uh, and uh, we haven't heard about uh, uh, this. I think it is a real topic, uh, this uh, issue of uh, uh, ma magnetic resonance. Um, now, as to the link between uh, watch uh, monitoring and expertise, we are more uh, comfortable with, uh, uh, sorry, at uh, ANSYS rather than at the WHO. So, uh, if uh, we can contribute to uh, this within ANSYS, uh, we'd be only very happy. Now, as to uh, the shape of the waves, uh, uh, I don't know if there is anybody here who can answer. I'm not saying that we covered uh, uh, your um, question. Uh, please uh, uh, give a big round of applause to uh, uh, the participants.